The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Hey there, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette. I am your host, and big thanks to Uku the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again to another episode. And today marks the start of Season 3 of the Graphic Histories Podcast. Um, the first season ended after about a year. The second one, close to a year, about 9, 10 months, just because I thought, well, my uh, my format got changed up. Now that I'm doing the bi-weekly interviews specifically instead of doing the character histories, I thought why not just start it anew with a new year, a fresh year, 2022 is here, and so is season three of the Graphic Histories podcast, and I can't thank you enough for continuing to tune in. I've had some great feedback in the last little while, I've had some great guests, and oh boy, do we have a doozy for the start of season three. David Cutler, graphic (laughs) artist, illustrator, comic book creator. From Newfoundland, a former roommate of mine, a good friend of mine. We spent time together when I was in high school and he was in college. We worked in the same store. And we were roommates shortly after that for about a year. And uh, yeah, man, I, I've done a lot of these interviews. And I, I learn a lot along the way. Um, and man, I've had some amazing guests and I've had some great conversations. But I can honestly say I think this is my favorite one. Dave's a smart, funny, engaging, charismatic guy. And uh, he has a lot of... You know, varying opinions and uh, ways of looking at things that I found very interesting and, and the topics we covered are pretty broad and I can't wait for you to hear it because it is a great conversation. Now this is part one of a two-part conversation because Dave and I spoke at length and I thought it best to probably break it up. I do not mind myself if I'm listening to a podcast that goes super long, a couple hours over what it normally is, uh, but... You know, some people do. Some people want to cram these in in the time period they have in their lives, and I don't want to hinder their enjoyment of this podcast by giving them an extra long one. I certainly don't mind when a podcast I enjoy splits an episode into two, and then I get to listen to the next half the following week. Well, actually, in our case, the following two weeks, but that will be the case this time. So I broke this into two parts. Uh, Believe me, it's well worth the time to listen to the entire thing. I, I don't like to edit these things too much because I really feel like you don't get the flavor of the person if you edit it, you know, very succinctly and tightly into just getting the information. I feel as though, you know, you get a flavor for the person. You know who they are. You get to know their, a lot more about them when it's a, the full casual conversation between two people. And I feel as though I would be robbing you of the experience of learning about Dave if I did edit it too much, and I'm not going to do that. So uh, in this episode, you're getting part one. Uh, Season 3, Part 1 of Episode 74, actually. So, uh, yeah, can't thank Dave enough for being in the show. I had a blast talking to him and catching up, and I'm going to definitely make sure to stay in touch with him because it's been far too long since we caught up. In the meantime, uh, life has been slowly rolling back to normal. I've I've been talking to someone today about the sort of COVID thing and, and where we are at with it as a society. I know every area is different. In my particular area, the case numbers are, are getting very high. Uh, kind of staying around, you know, 800, 2,000 a day, which is extremely high for us. I mean, they shut down the province when there was like 100 people a day. That was astronomical. So I know things are different. This version of the virus is less potent, as it were. Um, but I do stress people to get out there, make sure you get your booster shots, and make sure you prepare as much as you can, wear your mask if applicable, and follow the guidelines because, you know, what our, our um, doctor for the province is saying is that this we're getting into the endemic time, which is of the hope that this is going to be something we all just have to live with and the society will generally go back to normal and this will just be part of it like the flu. And I um, hope we're getting there. Um, you know, I feel like I've been thinking that every, you know, this is over in a few months for the last two years. 
And I'm hoping this time I'm right, but, you know, you don't know. I, I feel as though this one's hitting me. I feel like every time we get a lot of freedom and then, you know, things kind of get clawed back a bit. To, for our own protection, I'm not complaining. I don't think there's anything wrong with the the measures that are put into place. Um, it just, you know, psychologically, it, it hits you in a way that you can be social. You can spend some time. You might be able to go see a band. You might be able to get to feel like your life's back to normal. Go back to those clubs you enjoyed or those things you did for a little bit. But then when they're taken away again... I don't know, just sort of every time it seems to hurt a little more. So I'm hoping that we're getting there. But there are a lot of things that have kept me distracted, kept me having fun. Those things being movies and uh, books. I'm currently reading a Kurt Vonnegut novel, Breakfast of Champions, which I hadn't read before. I've read Good, I Love You, Mr. Rosewater and uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, and I love them dearly. I mean, Vonnegut may be one of my all-time favorite authors. Uh, his books are definitely up there, way, way, way up there uh, for me, and I'm super enjoying them. So, you know, make sure to keep yourself engaged, uh, keep yourself having fun, talk to friends, talk to family in the safe manner. You know, if you're doing it through Zoom, do that. But anyway, just make sure to look after yourself and those around you. Anywho, without much further ado, let's go into today's episode. Um, once again, I thoroughly enjoyed this talk. I, I hope Dave did too, and I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed having it because it was a blast. So Dave doesn't get a chance to mention in this podcast because it's split into two about the book that comes out next week. So when this, this drops on Saturday, I believe the following Wednesday, they will be the release of the Marvel um, Voices Heritage, which is their book which features indigenous stories about characters in the Marvel Universe. Dave has a character in it. I don't think I'm spoiling it by saying it is about American Eagle, was a very interesting character. I'm only saying that because they put out a preview online that contains who it is in the preview. So uh, Dave didn't mention it when we talked in the part two of this podcast, but it is American Eagle, which is very cool and a character I've always really enjoyed, especially since Warren Ellis' take on him in the Thunderbolts book he did, which I really enjoyed. So that was super cool. Make sure to pick up that book and keep your eye out for his uh, giant size X-Men uh, Thunderbird, which is coming out, I believe it's in April or May. No, I think it's March or April, March, I believe, uh, which is uh, a big book for him and a big book for the character of Thunderbird returning from the grave you know, decades after he died in his first appearance. Uh, so it's going to be super cool. And yeah, I can wait for you to tune into this talk. So why don't I let you do it? Here I am talking with David Cutler. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I said the beard. It's so long. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's my my Dave moved away beard. I started growing it when he left, and it's just continued on until uh, here. It must be like a millimeter per year. Yeah. <laughs> I've had it for quite a while now. Actually, it's uh, I don't know. I just I once I start losing my hair, I shave my head, and it felt like I, my face is really bald without something there. So. I oh just, yeah. Well, not you specifically, but me as well. I look like a baby. Yeah, so I just had that little chin strap beard thing I had when I knew you, and I was like, "This looks stupid." So I just figured I'd let it go and see what happened. And this is the end result. But it's like it's reddish too. It's... Yeah, I know. And people always think I'm a ginger because of that. Like I had red hair, but I didn't. Like it just the no. beard comes in that way. So, how are you doing, man? How how are things? Um, I'm freezing cold. The furnace is broken. I oh no. Got got it yet so it's it's so cold in the house but oh, other than that, i'm good how are you good you guys get a lot of uh, we got a big storm here i don't know what you guys got out you're in toronto right yeah it's yeah. it's freezing but there's hardly any snow it's like minus 10 or something yeah i think it's minus seven here but uh yeah there was a huge storm last night i went to watch some movies at a friend's place and i got stuck in the snowbank on the way home on the road there was the drifts just blew the road over and i got stuck oh, and yeah so i called caa and they're like uh yeah, they pulled all our trucks off the road, so you're gonna have to wait like in your car until the morning, or get a car. They call the RCMP to drive you home and leave your car in the middle of the road. So I took my ice, my um, my ice thing for the window, and I chiseled my way out after like an hour and just drove home. I got home at like four in the morning. Jesus. Yeah. So you misliv- you miss lived in Nova Scotia or what? <laughs> Not when it comes to the weather, I guess, but. Well, I mean, it's almost the same here just because, like, the littlest amount of snow, the whole city will shut down. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like you're in a whole bunch of snow because nothing's moving, even though 
it's like an inch on the ground or something. Really? It's funny because out here it's almost like everyone's so uh used to it at this point. You just it's like it's gotta be 30 centimeters before thing once it is 30 centimeters, things shut down. But like if it's like 15, man, eh, you know, we can get through that. Yeah. yeah. I remember my last year in Halifax, um working at Wendy's on Quinpool. Yeah. The, uh, um there's a huge snowstorm like early in January and all of Quinpool shut down like the traffic was just at a halt and Mm -hmm. that was like for four or five hours (laughs) and we're the only fast food place on that whole strip at least at that time Uh Um, there was also a mcdonald's so maybe they probably get hit hard too but uh it was just a freaking nightmare because the whole the the whole of that street came into the wendy's (laughs) it'll always be like a reason not to go back to nova scotia (laughs) although i do miss it i was there in 2019 for a con for a couple days and it was a uh, the city changed a lot, but it was still very familiar. So I, I yeah. quite enjoyed it. There's quite a bit of, uh, I guess you probably hadn't been back since you left, right? No, not since the 2000s. Yeah. Uh, so all that stuff they built downtown is that's uh, crazy. Hell of fact. Truro, Truro as well has, has grown quite a bit. There's a lot of new stuff here and a lot of newer stuff kind of building. It's it's sort of like Halifax is kind of becoming a monstrosity. And Truro's like, yeah. Truro's like the slightly, you know what I mean? Like a, a smaller version of that, that people are, it's more accessible, I think. And that's kind of until eventually people move enough, people move here that just becomes another Halifax. And then they go, I don't know, Amherst or something <laughs> somewhere else. City on the grow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. On the grow. Oh man. Well, I'm really glad uh, you could, you could uh, find the time to be on. It's really cool. To oh, yeah. I couldn't get it yesterday, but yeah, I get these horrible, horrible migraines. I think sometimes it's climate change. Like, well, not, you know, global climate change but mm-hmm. i got one the day after arriving in newfoundland for christmas that was just brutal and then the day after arriving back here I, same thing we just well, it could be the planes like barometric barometric pressure and stuff right like oh uh, yeah we could be science i haven't considered science yeah because um i don't have much issue with that but i know people that it sort of depends on on their environment I work with a lady that like if there's any kind of a spray like say you wear a cologne or something and it's just too much she's like out like just out. Did you ever like, watch Tim and Eric? What? Did you ever watch Tim and Eric? Oh yeah, yeah, love that show. Um, every time somebody says the word spray, I think of the bit where Tim calls into an exterminator. It's like a prank phone call bit. Yeah, um, it was about bees or something. I don't remember the whole shtick, but um, he wants to write um, "Happy Birthday Spray." His son's name is Spray, <laughs> and the exterminator guy's like Spray. Your son's name is Spray, and he's like short for sprayer. <laughs> those guys have such a like that type of comedy i have a friend that's a huge fan of them like he uh the steve Brule stuff we taught we quote all the time like the oh, Rally. Yeah, uh, cool. you know uh the uh what was the the uh, damn wizard got my brain and that sort of stuff but uh, <laughs> wizard got, my brain. got my brain praise be to gore the, the, um, the religion episode the yeah it was episode, yeah yeah thing. and <laughs> when he plays the altar boy and he's like, please be gored please be gored yeah, or when, so when the, he goes, they do the plane uh, where they're in the uh, the girl that goes up the plane, and he's like, and he's and he's interviewing the woman earlier, and he's like, uh, Cynthia Dingus, and then like at the bottom it says Cynthia Driscoll, <laughs> like shows up. Yeah. <laughs> like I love how every time he mispronounce someone, they show their real name underneath, just yeah, to, like. On the but uh, right. that and uh, love the person like corrects him, and then he just he repeats like he says something even worse the second time. <laughs> Uh, and then um, the one that we often joke about too is the uh, spaghetti, the uh, the guy, you know, the spaghetti, <laughs> spaghetti, <laughs> yeah. handing, handing out his business card. You know, uh, I, I'm available for parties and uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah well, like two, three years ago, I had dinner at the spaghetti factory with some people, mm-hmm. and the whole meal was just people saying spaghetti. That was that was conversation basically. <laughs> spaghetti, spaghetti. <laughs> It just, like, uh, there's something like uh, Eric Andre is really good at it too, but there's something about that level of comedy where it's like just forcing this insane absurd absurdity on average people. They're just living their lives, you know, like they just, he just pops out of a dumpster or he's in an, you know, and, and these regular people, they have no idea who this and, and just the weird hair and all the, like the, the odd <laughs> details they choose to just be really off putting and strange. Like if you just saw that guy in the street, you would kind of do a double take. Like that's a weird looking dude. But then, you know, like they, they, they do a really good job. They, they just, they put a lot of people, Eric Andre does as well. Like mm. he's doing his bit. They put a lot of people on TV that you wouldn't normally see on TV. Yeah. Like 
not regular looking people, but the, the kind of people you see riding a bus or something. Yeah. These extreme characters who never make it to the screen otherwise. Yeah. I, I always, always love to see it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, cool. Well, uh, yeah. So I guess like, I know we, we obviously we've been friends since uh, we worked together way back in the olden days of traders in the Indiganish mall when you were going to university and I was in high school and then we were roommates for, for a few years in Truro. So I feel as though I should know so much about you, but then I was thinking about when I was having you in the show, I'm like, I mean, I know you're from Newfoundland and I know you're indigenous. I don't know exactly any of those other details besides that. And I thought, well, I should get you on and, and flesh out the whole story. So. You know, for the for for uh, posterity, for future. Once you're the the big Marvel guy, now that you are. So, oh yeah, yeah. The, the five Marvel. Books. <laughs> so maybe maybe going on six Marvel books. If they're going on five, or going on six. Well, Marvel I mean, books, it's. Huh? I'm still incredibly proud of you, dude. Like I know, like as someone that I know that's been doing art forever. Um, you know, it's nice to see people that I've always had a lot of faith in, as far as their talent goes, to actually succeeding and in, in what they want to do. So the fact that it's kind of taken off for you now, I mean, hopefully it continues is, uh, is really cool. And I'm, I'm really happy for it. Hopefully it does. It was a, a long, long, long struggle. <laughs> Let's... I, mean, I still have like nightmare dreams about rejection. I literally had one last night. Really? About, uh, oh yeah. Because like a few years ago, like maybe four or five years ago, I had a, a portfolio review with PC mm-hmm. that was so brutal that, um, I didn't, I didn't go to the rest of the con that weekend. I, I just, I packed up, I brought myself home and I laid in bed and stared at the ceiling. Oh baby. my God. Cause he was just like, he's like, what did he say? He's like, um, like your meat and potatoes are there basically, but we can't use you. Like, um, there's, there's no marketable talent here. And uh, I was like, so what do I do? And he's, he's like, I don't know. Oh my God. Yeah. That is horrible. Not a company anymore. I mean, DC is a very different place than it was then. Holy but uh, it was it was devastating. So last night I had a dream that I'd gotten in with DC and I was going to do a run on Legion of Superheroes. Oh wow! But then Maybe I heard dream great that the, the writer was going to be The Rock, Dwayne <laughs> the Rock Johnson, and uh, he came into the um, <laughs> uh, he came into the offices and he saw like my cover for Legion of Superheroes, and he's like, well, "What's that?" And they're like, "Oh, that's that's Legion of Superheroes." And he's like, "I'm writing that." And like, we know. He's like, I don't want that. <laughs> That was, that was it. <laughs> well, that was it's it. uh, like the rejection continues even in dreams from the rock. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I woke up with that like hollow feeling in my heart, like something just did not work out. And I had to remind myself like, no, no one at DC knows who you are. <laughs> this, wow. This never happened. Like, You're when, not on the rock's radar. Were the... <laughs> he's like got his like tequila and all the other stuff that he's like hockey he just comes in with it all like jumanji did blu-ray and he's like what is that like, get, out of here. Yeah. get that shit out of here that's hilarious um so was that like was the guy the portfolio guy would that be like like in at, at one point because i know different people do that within that industry but would that be like a writer or an artist that was doing the portfolio no, he was just... he was an editor so he had hiring oh, and i see and, uh, wow, that is firing, incredible. Power. <laughs> that is incredibly horrid to like to to tell someone that and then be like, you know, th- like yeah, it's good, but we can't use it. Goodbye. Like, <laughs> like it's that's soul crushing because he can't even tell you to work on something or get something better. It's just, yeah. And, like, like I, I'd be able to understand it more if I showed up with like you know Scott Pilgrim or something. You know, something yeah. that was well, not that I'm comparing myself to that, but something that's like solid but it's so far off from yeah. what dc does that it's yeah. just like this isn't the place for you mm-hmm. but i mean cape comics is what i was i've been trying to do cape mm-hmm. comics is like the whole ambition mm-hmm. so to be like you're doing it wrong <laughs> but not actually be able to tell me like what what is wrong yeah yeah it was, that was soul crushing especially like so i was already like six years into like making a sincere effort at that point wow and so, it's and not to not to compare your art to other artists because I mean everyone's unique in their own way. But I always kind of thought your art sort of lo- reminds you a bit of Cully Hammer, and I, like just a bit. And uh, he's spe- a DC guy, yeah, yeah. And I was like, and he's a DC guy, so that's really strange. Like, you know, like really strange to me. I, uh, anyway, um, I'm gl- I'm glad you pushed uh, through and it all worked out because that's horrible. Like three or four years previous, Eddie Berganza at DC, mm-hmm. you know, formally, yeah, uh, more or less said the same thing. So I, I was just like, wow, I, I like wasted my life. I barked up the wrong tree completely. But oh, I mean, I was still a working artist, but I, 
the feeling that I get when I'm working on a superhero comic compared to like any other illustration thing is like it's not it's not the same. Like it's like ninety percent less of a work feeling and more of just like this excited juice when I'm working yeah. on a superhero comic. And when I'm anything else, it's like it is it is like going in almost like punching a nine to five. Like yeah. except it's more like a ten to twelve hour day depending on the project. Yeah, Bye. well, I'm 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 glad you're doing it, man. That's, that's fantastic. It's super cool. So uh, I guess to, to follow the path is this uh, this path of rejection leading to success. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's go back to where you were born. So Newfoundland. What part exactly? Um, I was born. Well, I was born in Stephenville in the hospital, but uh, mm-hmm. like my hometown is St. George's. Okay, which is west coast Newfoundland, uh, an hour south of Cornerbrook. Okay. Uh, and if you don't know Cornerbrook, that's, that's like the one thing that I can say. I do. It's more national park. Yes. I, well, I do know because, uh, like, I, you know, I wrestle and uh, I've done tours across Newfoundland. So I've been through, I don't think I made it to St. George's, but I've been, like, we, we wrestled yeah. in Labrador as well. So I wrestled across Newfoundland and then Labrador. So we had to go through Gross Moor and do all that all the way up there. But I've been to some pretty remote places. Like Harbor Breton is probably the most remote place I've been to oh, wrestle. Yeah, okay. yeah. I got my nose broken really bad there. Uh, I always tell this yeah in a wrestling match. I always tell this joke. Um, uh, I used to wear. I have different characters, and one one wears a mask, and the old mask was um, uh, fiberglass. Before I kind of wised up and got a plastic one. So one of the guys in the match made a mistake, and he railed me across the face. My nose just snapped, like, and it all caved in on the side. So like I'm bleeding everywhere. We finished the match. Uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan was on the tour, so he's like they put me in the car with him to drive back to Grand Falls, Windsor, which is where we're staying. And they dropped me off at the hospital. They're like, just call me when you're done. And I'm sitting in the emergency room in, in Grand Falls at like, you know, what midnight. And this doctor comes in. And he goes, uh, so what you do to your nose there, bye? <laughs> like that. And I was like, oh, I was like, the doctors are from here, too. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. They're all from here. Oh, yeah. not to make too much fun because I never I, I grew up with a little bit of the accent. Yeah. Um, you don't. I've never I if you never told me you're from Newfoundland, I never would have known. I, but I know I know wrestlers yeah, I that like. Know. Yeah, I know wrestlers that grew up like two streets away from each other, and one sounds has no accent, and one is like the thickest accent I've ever seen. So it's kind of discriminating. I, I, I guess. I'd always intended to, um, I'd always intended to go to school, like university and college on the mainland, and I would hear these horror stories that like you really get made fun of if you're from Newfoundland when you go to anywhere else in Canada. Mm-hmm. So I would very like carefully like practice to like not speak with my accent anymore. Really? Not that it was ever pretty strong, but it, but uh, the uh, the grammar was something that I really had. So I would say like I want to go here. Uh, I I need this before I can. So the the uh, improper conjugation or the you know proper Newfoundland yeah. conjugation. Where where, where are you so from and like, all that stuff sort of stuff? Very. Oh yeah. Yeah. Where, yeah exactly. Where are you to? So, or what you do? Or, yeah. What are you at? Stuff like that. So I <laughs> yeah. Had, what like, are you at? <laughs> Ease that out of my vernacular. Not that there was a whole lot, because there's not a lot in my area anyway. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the influence of there used to be an American Air Force base there in oh, okay. uh, the 40s. So I don't know if that's the influence, but lots of people don't have any accent at all, especially in the Stephenville area. How would how did you teach yourself not to? Did you just like watch movies or just like or like you know like TV or or listen to what other people were saying or because or just trying to like how would you? Like, what would be the benchmark for you to know that what I'm saying is improper? Just television, I guess? Yeah, pretty well. I, I, I knew the grammar because I knew, like, I got good marks, marks in English and uh, language and creative writing. Mm-hmm. So, like, when I wrote it, I didn't write like that. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I would write, you know, I want to go to the whatever. Oh, yeah. So you just but picked I would, it up. I would say I want. Yeah. And uh, I want sounded so, like, proper to me, like you were really putting on airs. Mm-hmm. So at first, when someone pointed out to me, I think it was my first girlfriend. Um, she was she was like m- making fun because um, it's so funny because now she's like this hardcore noob. Like she's like <laughs> I don't even know what she's saying. But she made she made fun and she was like, "Oh, you want this? Do you? You need that? Da, 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 da. So I, I saw, suddenly I was like, "Oh man, is that not just you know being cool? Is that not just the way people talk? <laughs> Do I have to fix that?" Yeah. So I would start to just go like. I, I want a piece of cake. Mm-hmm. I need, and trying to make it sound like it's normal to me as possible, mm-hmm. um, which is so sad and lame and like self hating. <laughs> <But>, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you felt it was important, but 
Yeah, I, it, that's interesting. It's an interesting uh, side note, I guess, about New- Newfoundland sort of depiction, or rather the way it's represented by the rest of Canada. That you, you had this. Amazing... It, was, it was worse way back then. Like now I, I don't agree. Know exactly yeah. What, I feel like the, it's uh, been more normalized, especially through comedy and stuff. Like, I know Mark Rich has a new show, and I saw a little bit of it. I haven't watched all the full episode yet, but like, it's not really, that's not played up too much from what I could see. You know what I mean? It takes place in Newfoundland, but it's not like. You know, you know, they, they, they really lean into that and, and make that the humor, um, which is nice to see. But yeah, I know it did, didn't seem like it was the butt of almost every joke in, in Canada for, for a long while. And I'm glad that it's in the 90s and early yeah. 2000s. Yeah, absolutely. But um, so, yeah, I can't even remember what the question was. anymore. Oh, uh, we're, we're just starting from where you grew up. So uh, so, I mean, comics was always a thing for you, right? Like. Um, since you were a kid. Yeah, I, I always think about it now that that some that me, if I, you know, if Moira McTaggart died and the whole universe reset and I, I was born uh, in 20, 2005 or something, me now wouldn't be able to be into comics in, in on the West Coast of Newfoundland because there are no newsstands. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no place like B&B Traders, but you know what I mean? Like Walmart yeah. doesn't have, Walmart is back to having like certain comics, but they don't have the monthly comics. No, um, but uh, as a kid, I knew like every store and what they reliably got, and I would mm-hmm. make my rounds like twice uh, a month. Like one of our parents would take us into town, and uh, we would hit up like Walmart, uh, AV Glance, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, Needs Convenience. There was a bunch of them, and yeah. we'd go all around. And by the end, we'd have like a, between us like maybe twenty, twenty-five different books sometimes there's an argument over who would get what because everybody loved spider-man and everybody loved the x-men and uh, everybody also wanted like whatever issue of gen 13 had like the hot cover you know <laughs> which was every episode of gen, uh, gen 13 in that time period <laughs> yes, exactly. so there's always like, be like a small like like i, I don't want to get whatever yeah, I think me and uh, I think it was Sean, uh, the word burglar there. We had a discussion about that, how the days of like going into a store like a needs or, you know, seeing a spinner rack in, in a grocery store or anything like that. Uh, those days are gone and you really need to fun- go to a comic store to buy comics really now, unless you go buy the graphic novel collections at a Kohl's or something. But, uh, you know, or chapters, but that's about it. Like to pick a floppy comic off the rack, it's you really have to go to a comic store now. You can't get it anywhere just on a new well, because because of like buying online, they're they're more accessible than ever, but they're not under your nose. No. So like somebody who's never read a comic is never going to go like go to Amazon and buy a comic. Yeah. But you, you have to like see it. To me, anyway, it's what makes me worried about the whole going digital because I I don't know where the entry is to that mm. because how do you how do you download comiXology in the first place if mm-hmm. you've never got anything on comiXology it's not under your nose it's not in your in your um sphere yeah so i i, I worry about the future of that with things going more and more digital because I, I i just think physical is necessary to like hook someone in the beginning when it comes to something like um i agree uh, I... That, that isn't like movies and tv that's like everywhere and unavoidable mm-hmm it's it's this it's secret club underground thing that i don't know what the entrance is to anymore yeah that, that's a really good point and like i don't i collect records and blu-rays and stuff so like i like physical media i like the ritual of taking something out looking at it looking at the box like a criterion or something blu-ray reading the book like going through all the special features i like the record too like you you get to listen to it all you don't just hear the one or two songs you like you listen to the whole output of the artist and, and if you really like them it's a real treat um and i agree with you on co- the comic front because it's really like I don't want to, you and I probably are are aligned in a lot of ways, especially with nostalgia and, you know, and, uh, but I feel like reading a comic, like in a physical comic, I just, I I don't like digital comics. I find it harder to find, to follow the flow because it doesn't line up as well when you're looking at the full page and making your decision on where to read. It's sort of because sometimes they get too dynamic with it where they're like, you know, panels are popping up and doing stuff. And it's like, I really just want to see it and read it the way it was drawn and colored in ink, you know? And so... Yeah, I can agree with you on that front. I, I don't know, like, I guess you would probably know better than I, but as far as, like, digital goes, is, like, are the sales digitally just, like, vastly outputting physical copies of single issues now? I have no idea. I, yeah. I, I think it, like, largely depends. Mm. Um, but something like, the, especially the Marvel and DC, like, keep that kind of close to their chest, those numbers. Um, so I, I don't really know. Mm. Uh, plus, a lot of them are goosed. Um, 
like I'm sure that if Marvel reported their um, digital numbers, they would have the you know every issue comes with the code to get yeah. the yeah right digital. So for every one of those redeemed, they would probably count that and stuff. And I mean, does that really count? So it's it's hard to say. Um, I certainly know a lot of people who basically only read digital, mm. and uh, more and more I'm considering it because I just the. Uh, I'm thinking about a two space. Yeah. But I don't want to not, I don't want to not support the comics, like my local comic shops. So I'm like, there's this real dichotomy with me with, cause we bought a house. Like I made a whole room into a library and it's like 90% graphic novels and I'm running out of space, like still, you know, so uh, I'm getting more choosy with what I buy and also, um, uh, you know, getting easier, giving up stuff. If I don't really care for it to get rid of it or give it away or, or sell it or trade it in or whatever. But, you know, single comics, my my buying for that has gone down significantly because I'm just thrown a space. Like, my basement is... It's I, nice. I just don't get them. I, I only yep. get trade just because I don't have a place to put the books. Yeah. Uh, anywhere. The, even the ones I have left, I'm just like, I got to do something about these. They're just occupying so much room. Yeah. And the, the more you get, the more, like seduced by capitalism you are you just getting stuff i envy people who have one focus like they're yeah. like i'm a comics guy because then all their stuff is just comics but when you have movies and you have music and you have junk ass toys and stuff um it's just, where do you where do you put anything I think yeah the, i know i'm looking the- i'm looking at behind you and i'm thinking about myself because literally it's mirroring what i got back here this is my office and yeah, well, uh you, you know yeah <laughs> then one, uh gremlins that i oh, have y- but. yes i have several there's uh there's the stripper one over here um and there's the, they made gremlins that big. yeah they're neca neca did them they're replica they're puppet replicas of the ones used in the movie um, that's nuts yeah yeah they don't actually don't move like the way they do but they are like this the outer shells are the replicas so there's uh that one's you can't it kind of can't tell on the screen but that one's striped with the hair right it's, it's no, just not spiked true. up yeah i have the the mogwai so i don't know who that is but Pardon? Who's the guy like the, the one next to next to Baby Yoda? Oh, just a regular yeah, gremlin. It's just uh, a regular gremlin. I guess yeah, they are very similar in design. It's just the hair mostly what makes them stand out. Um, there is the uh, Mogwai's back there too. There's Gizmo and uh, and the uh, he's by uh-huh. yeah, and uh, the other the other Mogwai that becomes Stripe is there as well. Stripe's Mogwai version is back there. Rick is whispery sweet nothings into Stripe's ear. That's right by my. Uh, old Mexican wrestling horror movie uh, poster. <laughs> La, La Santo and the Blue Demon, yeah. And my picture of uh, me and Stan Lee over there in the wall. Oh, so. I never met Stan Lee. I saw him for a distance of like 15 feet. That's as close as I ever got. I've told this story on this podcast before, but I'll, I'll tell you uh, just because I think you'd appreciate it. So we went to the Montreal Comic Con um, many years ago. And uh, just uh, before I started doing art and selling stuff at cons, I just go with friends to go go. And, you know, at this point, Jen and I were, we had an apartment and, or no, we were renting a house and, you know, things were going well, but I wasn't like super well off or anything. We drove up to, to Montreal and uh, a friend of mine who's a business guy was kind of like funding it mostly like just the travel and stuff. So we get there and I'm walking around. I got this where I met Ty Templeton, um, which is cool. I gave him a copy of my comic, that humbug one that I made. And oh, nice. uh, yeah. Oh, and wow. uh, I got to talk to like Sergio Aragones and, and I gave him copies of my comic to a lot of cool people that were actually really nice. Like uh, Aragones was one of the coolest people. He told me to come back the next day and I did. And he read it and gave me a ton of notes about everything, um, which was super, him and Sakai, um, who's beside him. But yeah, and I met Ty and I talked to him at Halcon years later and he remembered my book and gave me some nice nice comments on it. So it was cool too. But uh, they had the Stanley meet and greet where you go get these pictures with Stanley. Like, I don't really care about paying a hundred dollars to get a picture with Spike from Buffy. You know, mm. I was like, Stan Lee, I mean, it'd be cool to do it. And my friends all chipped in. So it was like 30 bucks each or something. So we got the picture and I'm like, cool. And I'm just, want- <laughs> I gave him, I'm like, Lee, I'm a big fan. I just want to give you a copy of my comic. That's, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And then he was like, thanks. So we took the picture. And as they're ushering us out to bring the next person in, I saw him throw it like this at his security guard. He was like, hold on to this. Like that. And then just kept <laughs> so later on, I'm walking along the floor and this guy comes up to me and I'm wearing a Spider-Man shirt. And he goes, hey, look, a Spider-Man fan. I won tickets to the Stanley meet and greet where it's, it's like $200. So you go to the top floor of a, a hotel, you get the food and the booze is all free and you get a chance to talk to Stan Lee, get him to sign a copy, anything you want, and get a photo with him. And I'm, he's like, I want it on the radio. My girlfriend can't go. My kid can't go. So I'm just going to sell it. I'm like, what do you want for it? He's like, I don't know, like 40 bucks. 
And I was like, I was like, ah, I'm here with friends. I don't know if like they'd be cool if I disappeared all night. So uh, I'll check with them and get back to you. And then I kind of forgot about him. I wandered around the con. At the end, he's like, I still have this ticket. And my friend Dave was like, you idiot, buy it. It's like the cheapest thing ever, you know, like 40 bucks. So I, I had a suit with me just because I thought we might go out or something like a suit coat. So I went back to the hotel. I dressed. I went back to, I went to this thing where the booze and the food was like, I, I drank way more than $40 worth of, you know, all this stuff. But there's a bunch of people there. And I had a long conversation with Gail Simone and like other people that were there, just like industry people at the con. Uh, and this is when New 52 was happening. And she was telling me all about that and, and some of the stuff going in the pipeline. So it was really cool. And then Stan Lee shows up and everyone is like, like they're all mobbing to get to him. It's like a mountain of people trying to get to him. And security's like, get back, get back. Just let the man eat. Just let him eat first. <laughs> and like, and so everyone's standing in a wall, like just like this staring at Stan Lee. And then he walks and he gets some food and he sits at the table eating. And as I'm standing there looking around me, there's like literally a sea of humans just staring at this elderly man eating, waiting so they can mob him to get their photo and their picture. So I was like, I felt really bad and, and like bad as a human. I'm like, this is horrible. So I just went and got more food and stuff. And then they finally started letting people in. It was kind of a madhouse. You kind of just get in, get a photo and get out. Like I didn't even get him to sign the Mobius and Silver Surfer comics I had that he did. Um, because I felt like it was, you couldn't, it was just get in, get your photo and get out. So I got a different photo with him that I don't have framed, but, uh, that was kind of my, my Stan Lee story. So I highly doubt he read my comic. I, I doubt it made it out of that security guard's, uh, hands probably to the nearest trash can, but I tried. Yeah. He's, I'm sure he gets a lot of that stuff, but I would have oh. loved to meet Stan Lee in, in any context at all, because it's like, there aren't many people like who, if Stan Lee didn't exist or if Stan Lee didn't do comics. I would be somebody else. Yeah. Completely somebody else. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who I would be if Stanley didn't do what he did. <laughs> You're like the some... same is true of, um, you know, Dicko and Kirby, but Dicko didn't do yeah. cons. And Kirby died when I had basically just started reading comics. So yeah. Stan is like the one that I could point to and be like, yeah, if that guy wasn't around. I, I don't know, man. Did you read the, know, the the book they put out about him? The Abe Riesling one? The True the Believer Stanley? one? Yeah, the True. No, true no. Yeah. I read it, um, and it, it. I wouldn't say it paints him in a, a like a, a horrible monster slate. It, do, it doesn't. It doesn't really paint him in a great light either. It just sort of paints him as sort of an opportunist that sort of fell into this and more of a carnival barker for comics than a than a real like hard hard creator. And um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in it. My biggest takeaway is that his daughter is insane. But uh, the 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 book itself is it. It's inter- It's very interesting, and it kind of talks about a lot of parts of his life that I didn't really know about his relationship with Ditko and and Kirby, which was problematic all the time, but uh, it's interesting, but uh, you can't take away his, his, you know, his stuff for the industry. I mean, he's, as far as comic creators go, he's by far and always will be the most famous. I don't think anybody's going to create anything that's going to ever, you know, be bigger than that. Well, yeah, when it comes to that stuff, I'm, I'm kind of a, a fairly big uh, defender of Stanley and his mm-hmm. legacy. Um, I think, to a, to a degree, like you, we've seen people always point out that, you know, after the breakup, Ditko went on to create other things. Yeah, it wasn't that great. Uh, Kirby went on to create other things. Stanley didn't really go on to create much of anything. Um, partly because he completely lost interest and was, you know, self-sufficient and didn't have yeah. to. The book plays uh, up so- a lot on that. It, it it plays a lot in the idea that he really wanted to be like seen as a real writer, like really write books and really um, do that, yeah, but never, yeah. never made it. I, I, I don't doubt it. Yeah, people always shoehorned him into comics his whole life, and he just was stuck there. Anyway, sorry. Continue. Being that I like practice not to speak with my accent, I can't begrudge him. You know, yeah, uh, be, being embarrassed of his origins in a time when they were treated very poorly by mm-hmm. the mainstream. But anyway, when it when it comes to the things that that Ditko and, and Kirby did afterwards, some of them are great. Some of them are fantastic. Um, large parts if not the whole thing of jack Kirby's uh, fourth world is brilliant but at the same time it's missing like this this spark of humanity that was in even the worst crap that stanley wrote in the 60s um there's like a, a a lack of a life to the dialogue um the characters kind of fade into one another depending on you know whether they're, where they're allied on the good evil spectrum mm-hmm. what but i don't know stan he, he brought the uh the identities to these people like uh, he made them resonate in a way that like 
I, I don't think Mr. Miracle resonates the way that Mr. Fantastic does. Mm -hmm. You know, your mileage may vary. And Mr. Miracle stuck around. Mm -hmm. But um, how much can you say about Mr. Miracle's personality, really? Mm -hmm. That's consistent across the depictions? Not, not a whole lot. No, that is very true because heroes at that point, like I think you and I discussed this before because I was thinking about it the other day about how back, like the Silver Age of DC even, like every like everyone's personality is basically their powers. They were all just good for the sake of good, good guy. Like the Flash was just Superman that ran fast. You know, Superman was Superman. The Green Lantern was Superman with the ring. They were That's all their deal was. They didn't have like complex stories or or personalities that you could really say, point out and say, you know, this is what makes them different. And like Stanley really brought that to the table. And I think people are kind of um, everything's got to be like absolutes, you know, like you, you have to say this guy did this percent of this and that percent of that. But in the end, I mean, the finished product is an amalgamation of all parts of it and, and Stan Lee's humor. And uh, he also like his writing is fairly eloquent in certain ways. He certainly had a robust vocabulary um, that, you know, is lacking in a lot of other comics. So he brought a lot of that, that fun and that heart to some of his stuff. So whether, you know, he decided that Galactus is a character or he designed him or that was Kirby, whatever. But the end result of the finished book is great. So, like, you know, why get bogged down in the minutia of what percentage of what went to who and where? I guess when it comes to money, you do. And that's the part where it normally fall, it falls apart. Well, but I don't super think that he went out of the way, out of his way to screw anybody over when it came to the money. No, no, I agree. Um, he does do things, did do things like he'll downplay. You'll never hear Stanley refer to um, what the, what's his name Mar Marty Goodman Marty Goodwin. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. They talk about that's his, him as his uncle, yeah, or his his elder cousin or whatever. There was a close family relationship. Yeah. He'll all just be like my boss. He'll never be like I got this job because I was the you know quirky little nephew. Yeah, they went hard but, into that too, uh, like in, in in the book, which is interesting too as well. So yeah, I agree. They, I, I they, love the. Uh, these are like stories everybody's heard i'm sure who listens to your podcast but i love like jack kirby stories of like the early days of stan in the office like all these like grizzled professionals down at their drawing boards trying to get stuff done and stan's like dancing around on a pan flute just just going to town just having the time of his life this little that's like a, that's in the book to me. yeah it's, it's so funny to imagine and then you know especially because like they're all like they're all artists and, and like you know the way artists are depicted in society now it's such a like you know a, a breezy like hipstery like we all just create and you know we're in a zone and it's all this sort of stuff and back in the day it was it was a job like you you know they're sitting there with suspenders and you know in in wearing ties and at a table drawing all day like like actual like same as they would be in an office you know in a oh, factory yeah. or something and you're right he's just like this 18 year old who got a job since so his elder cousin uh worked there like it, it was something to do with the jewish family higher hierarchy which is related in the book, but as far as the relationship goes, but yeah. And he's just like, like got the job. And he's just, yeah. they, they do talk about the part with the flute or something where he was just flooting around. His office. Yeah, it's, it's too funny to imagine. Yeah. But, uh, I feel no, like there's I, a good I, biopic in there somewhere. Yeah. We'll see the Stanley movie someday. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know how tight it, well, no, Disney doesn't have anything to do with his, his IP or legacy or anything. So, yeah, uh, we'll we'll see the Stanley movie someday. I don't know whose side it'll come down on. I would I might re prefer to see the Jack Kirby movie really with Stan as a background character. Yeah, but uh, I I do I do love and support Stanley and his uh, his legacy. I, I I think about it like um the the Hank Scorpio episode of The Simpsons, it's my favorite, where where Homer says um the good Lord gave us the atoms and it's up to us to make him dance. Yeah. Kirby and Ditko were the gods who created Spider-Man and, and the Captain America and whatever else. But Stan Lee made him dance, you know? Yeah. He made them yeah. dance and uh, the whole world is different because of it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's multi-billion dollar companies are built on this now. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's far beyond the, uh, you know, the, just the, the pen and scratch boards from back in the day. So, oh, yeah. And back like, before Spider-Man 1 came out, I remember the big question like, how is this movie going to do? Like, what is Spider-Man's Q rate really? Does, do people who don't read comics know who he is even? And then it was like the biggest movie of that year. Yeah. It, it's, it's been a different world ever since. It's odd to think about that, like how like Blade One came out and you're like, oh, this is based on a comic character. This is kind of cool. It's a fine movie, you know? And then like, and then the sort of door and then X-Men kind of kicked, like the door got creaked open and then X-Men like booted it open. And then it was, you know, and then just a little sprinkling of oh, different stuff here. Boys. 
<laughs> it's like, come on in. Yeah, no one's over. I remember telling people, like, I'd be like, you know, Blaine's actually based in the comic. And they'd be like, I don't think so. <laughs> Shut up, nerd. It's Wesley Snipe killing vampires. This is all we want. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I listen to this podcast called The Best Movies Never Made, and they talk about movies that never made it to or through production. And they did an episode on James Cameron's Spider Man movie that would have been made like with Leonardo DiCaprio playing Peter Parker, like in the 90s. Uh, Lance Hendrickson would have been Electro, who would have been a much different character, just a like a media, uh, like a, a super rich guy that used his electrical powers to become a super rich guy. Um, you know, the Sandman was just like a, but all their names were different. Like nobody, he wasn't Max Dillon, you know, that sort of stuff. So it, it's weird to think about w- where superhero movies would have went, even Spider-Man movies, I guess, to make it more narrow. But if that had been made, like if they, you know, they'd made that movie and where it would have went, it sounds like it wasn't great, but there are a lot of versions yeah. with Doc Ock too, that would have, that were like wind up with him marrying Aunt May and all these other weird things they took from the comics that, that never got, never got done. But it's uh, it's interesting to see those divergent timelines and where they go if 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 time had gone that way. It's funny to think back on like how much I wanted that James Cameron movie to actually mm. get rolling. Like yeah. I'd like read Wizard magazine and just be like, oh, it's coming, oh, it's coming. <laughs> and now and I look you, back on it and be like, man, bullet dodged. Yeah, you would have like I'm sure almost uh, like there's a point when you're just happy to see a comic book movie, like at that time that you, you let a lot of stuff slide that you probably wouldn't have. I know I did. Um, but now that it's not a novelty to have a comic book movie based on, you know, characters that you love that you're not, you're way more critical. I find. So like back then, geez, I probably would have been super happy, but looking back on it, I, I'm sure it would have been a garbage movie. I mean, oh, maybe yeah. Cameron's never really made a bad movie, I guess. I mean, depending critically whatever you want to say but as far as how well they've done he's always done decent movies so oh, yeah, may have been though. i've never seen avatar it's so all right I, I don't know it's but, all right uh, i don't get the yeah. the hype for the level it is i mean i think he kind of was lucky in that he was on a crest of like a cgi wave with uh 3d and all that sort of stuff when he was working on it that i mean it, it's impressive but i don't know i, I like life of pi better as far as that sort of stuff goes like the critical 3d avatar stuff um cool yeah so newfoundland you have two brothers right oh yeah two younger and, brothers and your parents uh what do they do i remember they were they're were still uh, around a, a nurse yeah uh she retired a few years ago and dad was a lot of things he was a carpenter a construction worker um and then uh for most of my high school life i guess he ran the um he was like the manager of the rexplex the town oh like event center place. oh yeah we had the skating rink in the bowling alley and cool. yada, yada, yada. well that's fun yeah. were they like as far as your first introduction to comics was it just finding them on a rack somewhere where your parents supportive or put them in your hands or uh it was the kid who crossed the street who brought over like um uh amazing spider-man 360 something it's like a mark bagley cover with him fighting the shocker mm-hmm. uh and i knew spider-man from the 60s show Mm-hmm. which still re-ran on like local channels and stuff that's so funny uh, that that, thought, that that's your that's your that's your introduction like oh yeah, yeah it is. that um, show is fun but it's it's a it's a weird it's a it's a very weird introduction to the history of spider-man that's for sure uh no i i, I was so obsessed with that show my, when i was like four my cousin sheena told me that their spider-man was fiction that he wasn't a real guy and that was like more devastating than finding out there was no santa claus basically um so when i found out that there was this whole like medium of like oh spider-man has like all these adventures that happen like every month i was like hooked right away basically mm-hmm. even though we're talking about the worst era of spider-man comics in in human history beautiful but, art though beautiful art i love bagley yeah, the art, the art was very good but i mean that's michelini's I, run, I'm not, right i'm not a biggest fan of the mary jane character and i think it dates back to those days because um they were like they didn't know what to do with her so there were all these stories about marital strife and uh, she was like chain smoking. Yeah, I was gonna say the smoking played into it a lot. She's always smoking. Yeah, and yeah. she nearly had an affair with like her co-star on the soap opera. Yes, uh, I remember so that. All that stuff stuck with me that I'm just like, what is? And then I'm then I saw Black Cat, and I was like, he's with, and she's just, I don't understand. Like, how did this happen? Because <laughs> she's a superhero. She's a lot more interesting than the soap opera guy. So I never really gave Mary Jane a fair shake. But yeah, that's that's the introduction with Spider-Man comics from. Bradley Strickland across the street. 
That's awesome. So what, what was your feelings about Gwen Stacy when you finally went back and found out that as far as he d- disliking his relationship with Mary Jane based on, on black cat? Uh, I mean, I was in college before I ever read a comic with Mary with uh, Gwen Stacy in it, okay. who was a clone. Oh yes. Right. Yes. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. I loved her character design. I love the green coat, the purple skirt, mm-hmm. headband, but I, I don't have like a lot of like, nostalgic love for her like my favorite spider-man girlfriend is still black cat which is like <laughs> kind of nuts because she's supposed to be like you know the wild and crazy you know bad influence one but i'm like no no you should have ended up with black cat. it's funny because mary jane was kind of that too like when, when they initially introduced them if you go back and read the old comics like gwen's like the nice standard earth girl you know it's like the betty and veronica she's the betty and uh you know veronica's mary jane the wild party girl the ones go out all the time mm-hmm. and they try to retcon it later that like you know gwen's death smartened her up and she became a different person but it's weird like you know talking about characters in comics is interesting to me because i mean they're all the subject of the writers who who do take cherry pick pieces from the past but everyone has their own take on it so if you look at you know people seem rather um bipolar if you look at their history of their characters and their decisions made based on each writer and where they wind up but yeah i remember those michelini uh um Spider-Man comics as well. She was always chain smoking. I remember one comic she had with Bagley Drew. She pulled a knife on a bad guy. <laughs> like oh, she really? was like a kitchen well, knife or something. Or she threatened someone with it. And it was, I remember the art was, uh, yeah, it's funny. The, the early comics you have and the ones that stick in your mind is the ones that you, you know, you read a lot. So obviously they're still have headspace. And even if they weren't necessarily the best comics in the world, you just read them so much that they're in there. Regardless, like I still finally remember reading this one Spider-Man and the X-Men team up against Professor Power and like wow. obscure, obscure. I know obscure, but it was like one of the 10 comics I might have when I started reading comics. So I read it all the time. So, you know, it, and then it kind of drills in your head is it's like, was it just good or do I just like it? Because I read it a lot when I was a kid and didn't know any better. Yeah, I, I remember one of the things that like sticks in my craw about Mary Jane and it shouldn't. Because maybe this writer didn't like her either. It was just like making her seem like an idiot because I don't know. It's <laughs> eternal misogyny. I have no fucking clue. But, uh, <laughs> Most likely. She's mad at Spider Man if she always was because Spider Man was out saving lives <laughs> and she wanted to come or whatever. Oh. Yeah, I know. Spider Man comes back and he's in full costume and he's hanging upside down from the ceiling and she's like, like arms crossed and her nose in the air like she's not going to talk to him and he gives her flowers and that's not enough and she's like you think flowers is going to solve this and he's like oh did i not mention this box of malabars oh. and she goes malabar <laughs> and right away like that's all she needs she jumps up and she like upside down hugs them and stuff and and I was just like, this woman is the worst. I remember, I remember that comic. It's funny too, because it's like she's a she's a model. You think she's eating box of Malamars on a regular basis? Yeah. Like apparently doing sushi snacks to her. Like she's just like Mary Jane, you're gonna come with us into the haunted house. No, do it. Yeah. Oh, what you do it for this box of Malamars? <laughs> Malamars. Turns to a rocket ship and blast off. So I always find that funny in old fiction when they do that. Cause it's like you could just go buy your own box, you know, like yes. what, you know, like it's like five dollars or whatever. Like it's not going to bankrupt you. Like we you're, you're, you're six figures a year on your show. I mean, Malamars aren't that hard to come by in 1992. Put it in your contract, your ride, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, high school reading, being a nerd, reading comics all the way through. I assume. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and even like I, I was like, because uh, you were like creating your like, own with like friends and stuff back then too, right? Sorry, you were creating your own with like friends and stuff back then too, right? Oh like, yeah, we had our own like universe and stuff. There was me at first. It was me, and well, I feel bad because um, uh, these two kids, uh, Michael Topham and Remy Cologne, had their own little comic going, but neither of them could really draw. But I always think back to it and think about like the cl- the climate of indie comics at the time, and how the two of them came up with this comic without any influence from that world and it was so like tapped into it it was called mr smith and hoo-hoo balls and uh they were the spirits of two serial killers who were reincarnated into um a flower uh, like a, a garden flower and a weed flower and they would go around and just have adventures uh they only liked each other and they hated everybody else and they're really like antisocial and stuff but there was like they did one where they went to barbie's dream house and they like it's not great. I mean, they chop up Barbie and Ken and stuff and go on. And there's another one where they tried to learn um, uh, martial arts. These guys, Mr. Toe and Mr. Ty. 
and there was this guy who always wanted to hang around them called Barney Mover. Uh, it it's was a very really lived-in world. Yeah, it, it reminds yeah, me of like a huge yeah. universe. The anti friend. There was all kinds of like crazy stuff. Sounds like Tony Millionaire. I was like, what if this? But Earthworm Jim. <laughs> let's let's put them in super suits. Make them superheroes. Forget the serial killer angle. So I like basically like stole it from them, and then Mr. Smith and Hoo Hoo Balls were superheroes. Um, and then from there, uh, I started like doing comics with other friends. Uh, all I, stuff. I love how you co-opted like like some kids in high school. It's like fun little comic you came in and like just destroyed. Well, they, they were friends of mine. I did it so like insidiously. Like I was like, I'll make a flower guy too, but this guy is like super cool and hip and stuff. And his name is Samuel, and he had like. 90s Ray-Ban shades. So they were like really weird, like uh, outsider art versions of flowers. Like, yeah. like Mr. Smith was like this crazy spiral design, and uh, Hoo Hoo Balls was like you just you just drew like this big jagged star shape, and however it came out, that was his face. But like picture like a Muppet flower with with Ray-Bans on. That was Samuel with this big wide grin, like this like Warner Brothers type character hanging out. <laughs> Uh, so he, I introduced him at first. They put him in a few comics, and then I was like, "Oh, what if there's this flower god who gives them flower gems, and then they turn into superheroes?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, they could go on a superhero adventure." So I drew that, and then after that, I was like, "No, that's that's this is what we do now. <laughs> they are just superheroes." <laughs> but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I went on to do stuff with some of my friend Ivan J. White, mm-hmm. who is uh, uh, still a great friend, and still he, he writes. Um, and uh, who else did I work with? Michael Strickland. I don't want to miss any of their names. Mm-hmm. He did all the inking. Like yeah. I, I would just pencil, and Michael would go over it in these dead pen lines. Something fell. That's all right. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I made comics with them all through high school, and I was like a big like pusher of comics on people. And uh, I, I, I would be frustrated because I only had access to like the newsstand stuff, mm-hmm. so I couldn't like give somebody the invisible. Or whatever, even though I knew from Wizard that apparently Invisibles was amazing. And I would try to like give like my favorite Nightwing story. Like I gave him to this girl, Deanna Gabriel, and I was like, here's what you need to know going into it. And then I wrote like 20 pages of like everything that you possibly have to know about Nightwing and Huntress and the relationship and background and who this mob is and they're tied into this. And I was like, wow, these things really aren't accessible <laughs> at all. <laughs> and then after she read them, she said she read them. She said they were fine. That, yeah. that was it. So I failed. <laughs> that failure still haunts you to this day i can see uh well th- that's cool man because like being I'm, i feel like i'm like that now i'm often giving graphic novels and stuff or i find them in like a used store for like a dollar ones i know are good like i'll pick them up and just give them away as gifts to people because i'm like more people got to read some of this stuff because comics aren't just spider-man stuff anymore which i love superhero stuff but you know like they give someone a chris ware book or something that they don't know they don't have no f- frame of reference that things like this even exist. Um, and they love it. It's eye-opening. And it's really cool. So I'm glad you're out there uh, waving the flag early on with the Nightwing. <laughs> when people would come over, like, to, like, friends would come visit my room. Like, they'd yeah. come hang out in my room. Uh, I do that. Like, I feel, think of it as, like, a Seinfeld thing where you want to make things look, like, elegantly disheveled. Like, you know, you've cleaned up, but then you, like, take some magazines and go, flip. So it doesn't look like you cleaned up. Yeah. I would like, you know, like curate like the best possible comics that I would want them to come across. And then I'd like throw them on my inflatable couch or whatever. I'd be like, they're just there. I was just reading them. <laughs> and the hope they picked them up and peruse, which never, yeah. ever, ever happened. <laughs> but you tried. And, and, and in the end, yeah, I feel I like that's try. the important part. I mean, you're, like I said, you're waving the flag. You're, 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 uh... <laughs> so you went, eventually came to Nova Scotia to St. of X. For uh, what, yeah, were, what were you taking when you were there? English. English, right. I was going to be a teacher. Was that some... the... what, why was that your plan? Uh, I don't know, because um, I didn't have the resources or the know-how to get into comics, basically. So it seemed not worth dreaming, um, almost. Mm. Uh, I'd taken animation classes at the uh, local college in high school. And uh, I, I did enough to know, like, <clears throat> I would be no more happy doing this than I would be digging a ditch or something. Like, mm-hmm. I was just like, uh, it was really mechanical to me. And I just, I didn't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and that was the only thing that I knew how to do because I knew how to go to animation school and get in that track. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do that. So I was just like, 
<clears throat> I'll go for the more reliable thing and become a teacher or a university professor, depending on how well I take to the course. Did your parents influence you at all as far as what you wanted to do? Uh, like, did they have a, a goal for you? or? Because they were very like, no, you should do art. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm going to go to the most expensive university <laughs> on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, and they were like, okay. Yeah. Uh, That's funny. Yeah, within a year, I was like, I, I fucking hate this. And it's, it's not something I'm proud of, but I went in with almost a full scholarship. And I got out by like the skin of my teeth, basically. Really? Uh, yeah, like uh, every year I did a little worse. Every year I went to class a little less. Um, I, I still, again, recurring stress nightmares. Mm -hmm. I still dream about being, you know, that that thing where you realize you had a whole class you didn't go to all semester. You totally mm -hmm. forgot about psychology 260 or whatever. Yeah. I have uh, that dream still, too, about high school. And like, like I have dreams that I did, like often I have the same dream that I miss, like, I missed some, some credit and I couldn't graduate and I had to go back for another, for something, you know, it's really weird, but it's interesting that you bring up the, uh, cause I had this conversation with someone before that like animation, because it, it's almost, like, I got that my whole life too, as a kid drawing, people would be like, Oh, you, you definitely should go draw for Disney or something like, like any adult can never, like when it comes to art, you have to go to something that's commercial and and mm -hmm. you, that's going to make you money. It can never be like, oh, you should write a comic book or you should paint or you should do any of these things. It's always like go to animation or something like that. That's like a, a surefire path to money to get into the big, you know, the big, the top. So um, I also I, have like your conception of it. Like you'll be making Walt Disney money. <laughs> if you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of whatever. Yeah, and there are a lot of horror stories about like people that animated movies that made tons of money and the animators got jack shit out of it, you know, like hardly any money or, or work overworked. Oh, it's like that. Yeah, pardon? The special effects industry now is like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. And like these movies that make billions of dollars and the spent like I remember reading the story about Keanu Reeves, like took a bunch of his money for the Matrix and bought all the special effects guys like motorcycles because he appreciated <laughs> their work. And I'm like, like he makes it he made enough money he could go buy like you know 30, 40 people motorcycles and not bad enough. Like he's a, a cool guy anyway, but you know, oh, yeah. like the this that he actually like the the actor who shouldn't have anything to do with this like stepped in to to repay these people when the studio and the director and the people making the most money don't you know don't seem to give a fuck so it's uh it's sad but you're right it is it is sort of the, the reality so yeah and so of course to connect our stories this is where we met because we worked at uh, traders together which was sort of a hobby shop slash convenience store in the Anaganish mall which was right across from yeah, the liquor store the closest thing to a comic shop in like in our radius or that's true and that's how we connected of course because uh it was com uh, actually i was working there first right you came later oh yeah you were, you were there yeah. i think when i handed in my resume there. oh actually probably yeah i started working there when i was 15 i, I did a job shadowed um there for school just because they sold comics and i liked it <laughs> like my mom's like you want a job shadow at a convenience store i'm like yeah they sell comics and i was just happy you know to be there and it sort of worked into a gig um which is funny but uh, I tell people the, the Ethan Hawk story about you uh, like fairly frequently. Oh yeah, I still dine out of that story. <laughs> yeah, I tell people I all the time. So yeah, when yeah. when when I mention it, I mean you should tell it better. But uh, when I mention like that he lives, he has a summer home out here, very close to where I grew up. People are like really, and I'm like, oh yeah, one time, and I tell the story. But what what's your side of it? Let's hear your your angle. Uh, my side of it is, I'm sure exactly what you tell. Like, yeah. The whole like mall was like a buzz with Ethan Hawke is in the mall. Ethan Hawke is in the mall. And uh, I knew what he looked like. So when he came in, I was like, oh, you're Ethan Hawke. And he's like, yes. <laughs> like, I, I said, like, I haven't seen anything with you in it. He said, I haven't seen anything with you in it either. And that's, that is the story. And then afterwards, I was like, the waking life. I have that on DVD. Yeah, that is a good movie. Uh... <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I it's a pretty great response too. I'm sure no one has said that to him. Most people generally try to fall over themselves, you know, to to say I've seen all these movies or just say like get your autograph or whatever. Uh, so I love that your initial response. Oh, I haven't seen anything you were in. <laughs> I think that's great. And I was like, oh, back filling the cooler or something. I was there, but I don't think I I saw this interaction. So it's a shame because I like him a lot, and he's going to be in a villain in a Moon Knight series on Disney Plus, whatever that's going to be. Oh, Wow. Yeah, yeah, he's uh apparently he he's never been a fan of like the superhero stuff, but I guess Oscar Isaac specifically s sought him out and said I want you to be the villain in the series. 
And uh, because they're a fan of each other's, you know, more artistic endeavors, I think they he agreed. So I don't know what villain he is. I don't know if they've established which one he is or who he is exactly, but ah, I'm excited to see what he does. I like his movies. Uh, yeah. So then after when you I moved to Toronto for school, then you continued to finish university. And then I helped run the traders into the ground. <laughs> No, the liquor the liquor store moving is what what they what oh yeah this Tommy's so decision. So Walmart comes to town and Sobey's moving. Yeah, the liquor store moving to Sobey's. It? Yeah, that was the death meal for that store because basically I think most of his money was ba- was made on cigarettes and pop from people going to the liquor store and then just coming across the street to get everything. He certainly he certainly wasn't being held up by the the comic books that me and six other people I knew or the magic cards were buying, but. Uh, uh, um, but yeah, it was a fun. It was a it was a good for a kid in high school. It was a, it was a great job for me, and, uh, oh, and I got it was to, a great job for sure. Yeah, and I got yeah. to meet some cool people, so I was happy. Yeah. So then, uh, when you finished school, you didn't know what to do, and you moved to Truro and lived with me for a while. Yeah, and then I drifted. To, well, Truro, I, I mean, I worked at Subway. Uh, I drifted to Halifax, and then I worked at another Subway for two days, and I was like, no, I can't continue this. So you went to Wendy's? Why why was Wendy's a better experience than Subway? What's the difference? I feel like they're pretty committed. I feel like Subway would be better because you don't have to cook like burgers. I feel like Wendy's has a a larger staff. So like there's a a more of a chance you're going to find people that you can at least, you know, get along with enough to make the day go by. Mm. But if you're on a Subway with one other person and you have nothing to say to each other, my God, is it Worst, and and worst. you were working like the night shift, weren't you? It was like overnight or something, wasn't it? From like, oh yeah, yeah. But by the end, well, not by the end. I very quickly took on the uh, like, like ten to six a.m. shift because you made like fifty cents more an hour or something. Oh, something. yeah, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't remember working that that went that subway too much. I can't imagine it was a very formative part of your life. Well, yeah. I, I, yeah it's like a, the uninteresting version of like uh, Frankie Muniz doesn't remember Malcolm in the Middle. Yeah. <laughs> remember anything of it. I'm like, yeah, I don't, don't remember that subway. Yeah. All these people that I talk to every day, I don't remember any of their names. Oh, well, it's you think about time and how it gets away from you. I mean, that was 16 what, years ago now. So. Yeah, I was, so. I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. I know I, I the, the the more I think about that the sadder I get so I try not to and we're gonna stop it there that is the first episode first part rather of my talk with David Cutler be sure to tune in in two weeks time for part two Electric Boogaloo, in which I talk, <laughs> finish up my conversation with Dave, and we get more into his uh, his work with Ty Templeton, um, and, and into his career with Marvel, and, and some of his work going on in the future and forward. So, make sure to not miss that. Also, make sure to tune in to my other podcast I do with Davin Skelhorn, a previous guest of this show, and uh, my co-host on the X-Rated, it's just called X-Rated, I don't know why where the came from, but X-Rated, the X-Men animated review show in which we discuss and review every episode of the 1990s Fox X-Men show. Uh, I don't talk about that enough on here, but I should because it's a lot of fun. We do it every Tuesday night, it's a live stream, uh, and then the audio gets put up in all your podcast forms uh, wherever you can find them. So make sure to tune in to that every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock um, Atlantic Standard Time, which is my time. And, uh, yeah, be sure to do that. So, uh, in the meantime, be sure to be back here in two weeks' time to catch a second part of my conversation with Dave, and I will catch you then.